This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Group audits. This, of course, is uh, additional list syllabus compared with what was studied at F8. And I suppose broadly, uh, the subject of group audits uh, differs rather, depending whether the uh, group auditor, the auditor of the group financial statements, uh, is the auditor of all the components of the group, all the subsidiaries, all the associates, uh, or whether the auditor of the group financial statements uh, is different to some of the auditors of the components. In the latter case, it's a little bit more complicated uh, because the group auditor is having to depend on work which has been performed by third parties uh, and will have to be asking the component auditors for uh, certain information which is required for the process of consolidation. The first thing we, uh, we ought to be doing when considering uh, group audits uh, is to determine uh, really the nature of the group. Uh, uh, what sort of investments has the holding company made? And the uh, the levels of investment we could uh, have, the, uh, the, the highest level of investment, uh, would be uh, investing in a company to make it a subsidiary. Uh, and if you're investing in a, a company which is going to make it a subsidiary, uh, the test of that is control. And it would be part of the... Uh, uh, group, financial statements auditor, it would be part of their duty to decide whether something should be treated as a subsidiary or an associate, or whether it's just a kind of arm's length small investment of some sort. So it would be important, you know, at the very start of the auditing process of the group financial statements, uh, to make sure that the proper accounting treatment for these components is uh, going to be applied. And it would mean that some of the evidence that the group auditor would need to look at. Uh, how do we know that we have control? Well, if you own 90% of the equity shares, you almost certainly do. Uh, so one of the tests they would have to do is to maybe look at the share register uh, and make sure that indeed this, this component is a subsidiary and is still a subsidiary. Because, of course, it would have been possible to own 90% of the shares last year, uh, but over the course of the, the year just gone by, uh, we get rid of a lot of those, so we just end up with maybe 25% of the equity shares. Uh, we've changed what was a subsidiary into an associate, or we could take it even lower. So we can't uh, just assume that the group structure hasn't changed. As part of the audit tests, we need to... Uh, to, to look for evidence of what the group structure is by looking at uh, share registers and, of course, by looking at uh, uh, other uh, records like board minutes and so on uh, to, to see if any discussion has been uh, taken place about changes in group structure. So the test is control for a subsidiary and it's full consolidation. You add assets to assets, liabilities to liabilities. You calculate the goodwill. Uh, you have to work out the non-controlling interests and so on. Uh, you bring all of the profit into the consolidated uh, uh, statement of profit. Uh, and then you take out again the uh, proportionate share that belongs to the uh, 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 people who, you know, the, the, the non-associate uh, proportion. A joint venture is a kind of once-off, unique uh, uh, association by contract. Uh, again, you would have to look at the contractual arrangements to, to see what's going on there, but essentially it's going to be uh, equity accounting. And at the very lowest, uh, we uh, have uh, investments, where well, maybe we own 3% of the shares of a company. It's not an associate, it is not uh, a subsidiary, uh, it is not going to be figuring really in group accounting at all. It is just an investment. Uh, we'll keep it under review for impairment. We have to uh, be confident that uh, control is uh, present. 
if something is going to be treated as a subsidiary. Uh, and by and large, if uh, a one company owns at least 50% of the equity of another company, uh, then uh, control is presumed. But the, the real test is, do we have power over our investment? Do we have the rights to variable returns? Can we uh, affect what those variable returns are by bringing some power to, to, to play in how that investment is uh, managed, uh, maybe the amount of dividend it's going to be uh, paying and the like. So it is control and power that we're looking at. Uh, uh, but as I say, generally speaking, if you own more than 50% of the shares, uh, that control and power is presumed. But you need to look in any question at some little bit of detail, uh, uh, perhaps, which would maybe uh, add little complications to that kind of 50% cut-off point. One of the things in a subsidiary uh, that has to be uh, verified by the group auditor, because it only appears in the group financial statements, uh, the goodwill does not appear in the holding company, does not appear in the component companies. It is only a figure which is calculated and appears for the purposes of the group financial statements. Uh, we have to verify the goodwill calculation, uh, particularly in the first year. Uh, but then subsequently, we always have to look at that for impairment. Uh, if the subsidiary is uh, showing a very bad trading history and gone from profit where it was worth buying into losses where we wish we never set eyes on it, uh, then of course it, it's a bit of a fiction to maintain that the goodwill uh, is, is still there as some sort of valuable intangible asset. Anyway, at acquisition, certainly if it's been acquired during the first year, uh, then we uh, have to calculate the goodwill. It's the fair value of consideration paid, which might just be cash. But if there's deferred consideration in there, we would have to say, well, in five years, we're going to pay some more cash. It has to be discounted to the present. Uh, if we are uh, making a deferred payment of shares, uh, then we have to uh, estimate what the current fair value is of that deferred share consideration. Then you add on the uh, uh, value of the non-controlling interest, and we compare that uh, to the fair value of the subsidiary's net identifiable assets. So it's uh, what we uh, paid uh, uh, less uh, the fair value of subsidiaries, that's all of basically all of the subsidiaries net identifiable assets and in a way we're taking out the uh, the value of the non-controlling interest uh, within that. The value of the non-controlling interest is either its fair value or we can take a proportional uh, effect. Uh, we can look at the subsidiaries total identifiable net assets uh, and say, well, the non-controlling interest has got kind of a 20% of the company, therefore 20% of the uh, fair value of the subsidiary's non-identifiable uh, 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 net assets uh, is really not belonging to us. We haven't paid for that. It is staying uh, as part of the non-controlling interests. As I say, this has to be done particularly in the year of acquisition. Uh, but then subsequently we have to review that uh, for impairment. Associates, associates are not where you have control, but where you have significant influence. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if you own between 20 and 50% of the shares in another company, it is presumed you have significant influence. But there might be situations where you only own 15% of a company's equity, but maybe that 15% gives you a, a right to one or two seats on the board. Uh, and almost certainly, if you have one or two seats on the board, then you have significant influence. And the, the associates should be regarded uh, uh, on the basically uh, equity accounting. In equity accounting, counting the uh, statement of profit and loss, uh, it's the uh, profit before tax, uh, and we need to bring in the group's share 
of the associate's profit and income. Uh, so as in consolidations uh, and subsidiaries, you bring in all of the subsidiary's income and then you take some out for the non-controlling interest. Here we only bring in our share, the 25%, if you like, uh, of the associate's profit. In a statement of financial position, the associate will be represented uh, there at the original acquisition cost of those shares, plus our share, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, plus our share of the associate's post-acquisition reserves. In other words, the profit it's made since we bought in uh, and which it has kept. We want our share of that. But again, we need to watch here about uh, impairment. The cost we paid uh, may now have been a kind of expensive mistake, uh, and the 25% share that we bought in this associate uh, may well be almost worthless, and we have to be prepared to write it down under uh, the results of an impairment review. So that's the first thing. Know what the group is, know what these components are, what the proper accounting treatment is going to be uh, for both the statement of financial position and the statement of profit or loss. Now, it's important to realize that the group engagement party is responsible for, in a way, everything to do with the audit of the group financial statements. And indeed, the group uh, engagement partner is not even allowed to mention that some parts of the group may have been audited by third-party auditors. The group engagement partner is responsible for the direction, supervision and performance of the group audit, is also uh, responsible for, uh, for uh, uh, assessing the materiality for the group financial statements. And sometimes the materiality required or measure for the group financial statements is going to be lower than the materiality for some of the component companies. Because if one of the component companies has made a loss, uh, then the group uh, profit or loss could actually be lower than some of the uh, individual subsidiaries profit or loss. So it is the group uh, uh, auditor who determines the group financial state materiality. Now you'll understand, of course, that this may uh, cause some difficulties in the audit because you have your maybe third party component auditors. All they see is the company they're auditing and they will be determining materiality based on the company they're auditing. Whereas the group engagement partner actually wants them to audit to a, a stricter level of materiality. So one of the bits of communication that has to take place is that the group engagement partner will have to tell the component engagement partners uh, the levels of materiality to which they have to work uh, and produce you know, statements of uncorrected uh, misstatements and the like. And it is a group engagement partner who has sole responsibility for the group audit opinion. And it's only a matter material to the group that will affect the audit opinion. So it would be feasible for one of the components uh, to have an audit opinion which has been modified in some way. Maybe the auditor says that it doesn't show a true and fair view or uh, except for this it doesn't show a true and fair view. But when that component is kind of uh, subsumed, if you like, into a, a vast group, uh, then the little qualification, you like, or the qualification of the little subsidiary company is of no importance at the group level. We need evidence uh, also when we're doing the group audit uh, about the individual components uh, we need, uh, we'll see evidence, for example, maybe about uh, profits uh, which have been not realized, which is uh, uh, in some of these group components and which in a way only, uh, again, figure in the group audits and the group financial statements. 
We also need, as well as getting this information about what's gone on in the uh, individual component companies, we need to audit the consolidation process itself. Uh, we need to see that all the companies have been added together correctly, for example, to get the consolidated statement of financial position. We need to make sure that the goodwill has been handled correctly. We need to make sure that the current accounts have been reconciled and cancelled out. We need to make sure that unrealized profits are removed. So subsidiary A sells good to subsidiary B. Subsidiary A has made a profit, which is fine in its individual component accounts. But of course, if the two subsidiaries are part of the same group, uh, you can't have inflated inventory values sitting around simply because stock has moved around within the inventory and we uh, within the group and we have to take out the unrealized profits in inventory or transfers and non-current assets. The amount of care that the group auditor has to take uh, in getting, if you like, information about the component companies and about the amount of work that has to be done on component companies uh, depends on whether or not they're regarded as a significant component. So think of significant component as material component. It's a matter of judgment. Uh, I put in here 15%, uh, but 15% is not anywhere in any sort of auditing standards. Uh, it could be a percentage which the group auditor has decided on. Uh, maybe it's been decided on uh, on the you know roughly in line with uh, benchmarks for. Uh, other uh, uh, measures of materiality. Uh, it could easily be, you know, the 1% to 2% uh, of the group assets, for example. But they have to determine a benchmark figure using their judgment. If it is a significant component, uh, it means it's important, it means it's, means it's material, then uh, there is a requirement that a full audit is performed on that component. In a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a big asset, if you like, in the consolidated financial statements. And if it's a, a big material asset in the financial statements, then the only way we're going to get any sort of assurance that it's there correctly is to do a, a full audit on the component, either our, ourselves, or we get the component auditor to do it. If it's not significant, uh, we're saying it's, it's essentially immaterial. Uh, uh, it's, it's almost it can be insignificant in the group financial statements. Then we don't need to have or have done a full audit. We can uh, get away with analytical procedures at the group level. So we see what sort of profits that little subsidiary is making last year, we see what they're making this year, we have a look at the way the amounts in the statement financial position have moved, and if they seem kind of uh, credible uh, and and not, not particularly noteworthy, then we don't need a full order to have been performed on the group and the component company. Because we are relying uh, uh, on a third party, if the component auditor is not the same as the group auditor, uh, it means that the audit team is putting some reliance on the work of the group, uh, the component auditor. And like putting some reliance or using the work of any third party, we have to assess their independence. We have to assess their professional competence. We need to know whether they're working to reasonable ethical standards, because of course that would undermine independence and objectivity, uh, professional competence in due care and, uh, and, and, and so on. We have to uh, uh, decide whether the group auditor maybe needs to become more hands-on, more involved with the work of the component auditor. For example, uh, the group auditor might want to see some of the component auditor's schedules. The group auditor might want to discuss with the component auditor areas of particular risk 
which were in the component company uh, and how the component auditor addressed and reacted to those areas of particular risk. And we also want to see that the component auditor is operating in an environment where there's a suitable, acceptable regulatory environment. So we're looking at uh, ethical standards. We want to have an idea of what the uh, uh, uncorrected misstatements might still be. The accounting uh, policies really have to be brought in line throughout the group and some of the adjustments uh, uh, that have to be made will depend on communication between the component auditor and the group auditor uh, that will allow the group auditor to, to, to adjust the accounting policies so that they're in line. Should also say that the uh, year ends have to be coterminous. The year ends of all parts of the group have to be the same. And if there were uh, three months adrift, really, again, the group auditor has to have information which allows the uh, adjustment to be made in the group accounts. So basically, you add on the next three months, if you like, and take off the previous three months so that you would have the, the profit for the you know, group audit period, if you like, being brought into the group financial statements. The group auditor would also be interested in any material deficiencies that were discovered in the internal control of component, internal uh, 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 material deficiencies in internal control imply uh, effectively a control risk. Uh, and we want to know how the component auditor has uh, reacted to the increased control risk, we would hope, uh, by doing more work, more substantive tests uh, at the period end. Any suspicions of fraud or irregularity, uh, we want to know about that. Uh, again, we would want to know what work the uh, component auditor has carried out to assess whether frauds have occurred and what their size and incidence is actually uh, reckoned to be. And finally, uh, if any limitations had been put on the component auditor's work, if they hadn't been allowed to inspect certain contracts or hadn't been allowed to uh, peruse through the, uh, the the board minutes and so on, if they hadn't been allowed to attend the stock take, uh, then uh, there's a kind of you know loss of confidence in the integrity of the directors of that component company and the group auditor would be getting a bit anxious uh, about the reliability that could be placed in the component company's financial statements. The consolidation process. Well, how does consolidation process take place? Uh, and when I was uh, learning to be uh, an auditor, uh, believe it or not, uh, this was uh, before spreadsheets. Uh, and what you had uh, in a group company, uh, the subsidiaries would send up their separate financial statements. You'd end up with, you know, about 12 statements of financial position, about you know, 12 statements of profit or loss. Uh, and really what you would do, literally these written bits of paper, and you kind of stick them together. So you'd have your line of, statements of financial position there and then at the end you'd have your group one here and you had to go across adding them up adding non-current assets to non-current assets inventory to inventory and so on and of course there was a, a tremendous opportunity just for arithmetical error uh, you misline something you punch it into the uh, your, your calculator incorrectly and, 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 and so on and you just add, end up with a, a basically a consolidated statement of financial position which is full of arithmetic errors uh, and, and one of the things first things you had to do was just do a great big adding up exercise and sometimes in large orders you had a special person who came out who was very adept at, at operating adding up machines uh, and they would do this rather rather dull work on behalf of the audit team. 
You have to review the adjustments. We've talked about that already. You have to look at the goodwill. Uh, you have to look for impairment on it. If the, con if the acquisition was part way through the year, uh, you would have to split the, the profit, say, uh, into pre-acquisition profits and post-acquisition profits. Uh, this is an adjustment which is only really going to be coming in uh, uh, upon consolidation. It doesn't matter to the component companies uh, at all. Reconciliation of intercompany balances, worrying about goods in transit, cash in transit, getting the current accounts to reconcile uh, and essentially to, to cancel out on a group-wide basis. We need to keep an eye on the events after the uh, uh, reporting date. These may have a profound effect on the financial statements of component companies, of which, of course, we might not be the auditors. So again, part of the communication we require to obtain from a component auditor is that we are kept up to date with events after the reporting date. We need to put in fair value where appropriate of assets and goodwill and, and uh, values of uh, uh, associates as they appear in the statement of financial position. Use the right approach, arithmetic accuracy, uh, compliance with legislation. And lastly, I put in here something called a letter of support. Now, what a letter of support is, is you could have one of you, your subsidiaries, let's say this one, which is in a very precarious financial position, and they're going concern problems about it. Uh, and what sometimes happens, uh, and they can't get any more, more money from the bank, uh, uh, and so we need to, to think, you know, what, what maybe is the fair way uh, to draw up these financial statements? Uh, 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 should we draw them up maybe on a, a breakup basis or is a going concern basis still okay? Particularly if the bank isn't going to lend them any money. But sometimes what happens is that the holding company will say, well, I'll, I'll support them. I will act as their lender of last resort, if you like, and I will make sure that they survive. In which case they can still be uh, have their financial statements prepared on a going concern basis. Now, what the auditors of the uh, uh, group financial statements will require is for that promise to be formalised in what's called a letter of support, sometimes called a letter of comfort. It's basically the holding company saying, "Yes, we will." support this group company to ensure it survives for the foreseeable future. So they give a letter, uh, but of course uh, the director's just making a kind of assertion, yes, we will support them, uh, is rarely sufficient audit evidence. So what the group company auditors need to do is to assess, uh, for example, can the holding company actually afford to do that? So if we think that maybe a, a, a transfer of money of about five million is required, uh, and all we see really that the, is about one million in here, we have to think, well, where is a holding company going to get the extra four million? Can it go to its bank and borrow and then pass that amount on uh, to the subsidiary? We would also like to see that promise like formalized in letters between the, the uh, the two companies, and also in the board minutes of the holding company, so that it looks as though they are really uh, serious uh, and are actually capable of providing that financial support. Two further matters, not so much to do with group consolidations, but nevertheless they're usually put into to that sort of a part of the, uh, the syllabus. First of all, a joint audit, where you have two audit firms giving their opinion, a uh, joint opinion, on the one company. So more than one audit firm responsible for the audit opinion. Why does that happen? Why would you have two auditors uh, with two fees to pay? Because it nearly always ends up more expensive. 
um, because they have to both do a certain amount of ground work, a certain amount of duplication, if you like, uh, in in, uh, in in some of what they're doing. And the causes are sometimes it's takeover. Uh, so you have a, a, a two, or particularly mergers, two large companies merge. <coughs> Auditor A knows about this company. Auditor B knows about that company. They merge, and it might actually be slightly more efficient for a while uh, to let the two old auditors stay auditing the companies that they're they're relatively familiar with. Uh, it might be done for reasons of geography. Uh, this company's in one country with one firm of auditors. This company's in another with that firm of auditors. They kind of merge, but essentially are in their own countries still. Uh, and, and the two auditors simply don't have uh, branches in the other country. It could be political. Sometimes as a, almost as a price of agreeing a takeover or a merger, uh, to keep the, the shareholders happy and content, you say, well, we'll keep the, keep the existing auditors. And sometimes maybe the, the client prefers it. Sometimes the client says, if I've got two firms of auditors, they both have ambitions to win. And therefore they'll both be trying really hard to impress me and giving me really good value for money in the hope that in a few years' time I get rid of one of them uh, and, and I give all of the audit to, to, to the winner. What normally happens is they will split the work. Uh, it would be uh, silly if they both audited inventory and both audited receivables, and so they'd just be kind of duplicating each other. So, so there has to be some sort of sensible split of the work. But then it, they're giving a joint audit opinion. So if I'm signing off the audit, I'm signing it off on all the financial statements, even though my firm might not have audited inventory. So, of course, we do therefore need to be confident that my joint auditor is doing it properly so that they are independent, uh, that they have competence, that they are working to uh, ethical standards, that they are working to the international standards of accounting and, and, and so on. Uh, otherwise, I'm putting my trust, if you like, for almost half the figures in the financial statements to this other auditor uh, about, you know, whom I know nothing and who might be doing a, a really bad job. So again, there's another kind of instance of relying on third parties. And finally, we have transnational audits. Transnational audits, a bit different to what's called international auditing. International auditing is where, for example, if you're auditing Ford Motor Company, uh, I think only one company does it, only one firm does it, but their American branch does the audit in America, the UK branch does the audit of uh, UK manufacturing plants, and so on. That's an international audit for that firm of auditors. A transnational audit means where the audits of the financial statements take place in one company, in one country, uh, but this, this is a company uh, whose financial statements will be used in other countries. Maybe there are international bankers involved. Maybe there are international shareholders involved. So you could have people in America using accounts, financial statements produced in the United Kingdom to base their lending decisions on from America or their investment decisions on from America. And this makes things a little bit, a little complicated, uh, because if you're looking at financial statements prepared under another jurisdiction, then how do you know what regulations and ethics are being applied to the preparation of those financial statements? How do you know what auditing standards have been applied? How do you know what accounting standards have been applied? How do you know what uh, uh, corporate reporting standards or corporate management, co co I mean, corporate governance standard, standard, that's what we say, corporate governance, I think. How do you know what corporate governance standards uh, this uh, company in this other country 
is actually applying. And it's, it's a bit of a headache, uh, uh, really. Uh, and uh, all we can say is that there are great efforts going on uh, to try to bring into line audits and standards and ethical standards on an international basis. Uh, and you'll read in uh, the notes this idea of a, a firm of firms where large firms of accountants get together and say, right, in, in a way, all of our clients almost depend on uh, transnational information uh, here. And it is in all our interests, if we can get a, a, a uniformly high standard uh, and a kind of uniformly high presentation on financial statements, wherever they're created, uh, so they can be used kind of safely, confidently, reliably uh, anywhere in the world.